Well, as we turn back to chapter 31 of the book of Numbers, we remember that last week we concentrated on the first part of this 31st chapter. And it had as its title, The Punishment of the Midianites. We had part one last week and now part two tonight. And we think of verses 25 and onward for the rest of the chapter. We thought about the holy war against the Midianites. How the war was fought. We thought about the outcome, victory for God's hosts of Israel. But the second section of the chapter concerns the distribution of the spoils of the war, the results of the conflict. We read this short portion earlier, verses 25 to 31, just to illustrate what went on. But tonight we're not going to go through this passage verse by verse, but rather we're going to draw out some principles that are applicable to us in our Christian lives that emerge from the text of Scripture by way of application from this post-war activity of Israel. And the first thing that we notice tonight, our first point, is the thought of the Christian conflict. And here we've had conflict of Israel with Midian. We remind ourselves what this war with Midian was about. It was not a private revenge. It was not national covetousness. If it had been, it would have been an immoral act. No, it was a solemn act of God's righteous judgment and his government. And in it he displayed his righteous hatred of sin and carried into effect the holy principle which will appear in the next chapter. And we're all familiar, I'm sure, with chapter 32 and verse 23. It's those uh, two numbers round about and it is that uh, special verse be sure your sin will find you out it's an oft quoted phrase that's for the next chapter but it was a principle the sin of the Moabites and the Midianites who had caused Israel to sin found them out outside the kingdom of God and yes the Lord God had given the command and the command was there early in the chapter avenge the Lord of Midian Avenge, avenge the Lord of Midian. But this was to teach Israel that only success that they had and all success that they had was in his hands, his mighty hand of power and certainly not in theirs. And so the priests with the holy instruments, the two silver trumpets, were as necessary as their weapons of war their spears and their swords and their shields and anything else that they used to wage the war against Midian. But no, this time, as we noticed last week, that the priest went with them into battle, Phineas, with his holy instruments. Indeed, these were a practical warning against a spirit of revenge in the heart of the Israelites. It was an encouragement to wholly depend upon Jehovah. It was a holy war. But the next point to think about is progress. Progress of the children of Israel in their righteous activity. These events of war with Midian showed the way that they had had earlier battles. The very first battle that they'd had to deal with was just a few months after they left Egypt, when they were attacked by the Amalekites. Remember that occasion? where Moses stood on the hillside and as he lifted up his hands, then Israel prevailed against the Amalekites, but he got tired and the hands went down and he needed Aaron and Hur to hold them up. And so Israel prevailed and they did win that battle, that war. And then again, the Edomites with their two, two kings, Sion and Og, those had been fought as they progressed on the east side of Jordan, moving north towards the Promised Land when they were denied entry into that territory and the wars that they had there meant victory over those people and spoils, but they had been acts of faith. No priest had gone with them into the conflict with those armies. No holy instruments had been carried with them. 
No trumpets had blown, no the priest stayed behind in the tabernacle in the, in the camp. But this time was different. Now Israel were engaged in God's battles and with them went God's terror. The hearts of their enemies became supernaturally stricken with fear because the Lord God remembered his covenant with them. He had promised to bring them into the land, promised to their patriarch forefathers, to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. And by way of application, this may suggest to us, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, that there is a difference between the earlier and the later conflicts that we have as Christian believers in the way of faith. When we are young, when we're inexperienced, when we've not long been converted, and that experience in spiritual conflicts, we generally have too much confidence in ourselves. But when the Lord has taught us the deeper lessons in the work of war, confidence in self becomes diminished and trust in the Lord is enhanced. And we tend to think early on that we can do it all ourselves, that we have the opportunity to fight the battles of the sins that oppress us in our testimony, in our fight with indwelling sin, in our coping with opposition. We think we can conquer. Yes, but before long the defeats come and the failures and the disappointments and they prevail. We're not as strong as we thought we were. And it's not our courage or our skill or even perseverance that wins the day in spiritual warfare. And we learn the lesson, who is sufficient for these things. Of ourselves, we are not sufficient. Oh, but we have a Saviour who is sufficient. And our eyes are open to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our priest, who is ever-present, who is eternal. And our confidence is now in him, and we take him with us into our battles. The holy instruments of the sanctuary, the silver trumpet of the glorious gospel which we proclaim and which we preach. These are our hopes of victory. And indeed, my friends, they are our only hope of victory. We rest on him, our shield and our defender. We go not forth alone against the foe. We rest on Jesus, relying utterly on his precious promises of scripture. Yes, so often we feel weak in ourselves. But we have his word. We have his word in the language of the Old Testament in Psalm 18 and verse 32. It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hind's feet and setteth me upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy right hand hath holden me up, and thy gentleness hath made me great. And so, yes, my dear brothers and sisters, we must guard against self. Self is the reason that so many of us stumble. Self-confidence. Because we're so dependent upon ourselves, it is often the reason why we are subject to severe discipline under the hand of the Lord. You see, Christ on one hand and self on the other, they are two opposites. But Christ and victory, they go together. Self and defeat, yeah, they also go together. But the more that the Lord Jesus Christ lives in us, the more complete will that crucifixion of self become, which will lead to the greater victories over our spiritual enemies. We will be strong in the Lord, and we will be strong in the power of his might. Progress then. Progress in us, progress in the Israelites, as they learn to trust in Jehovah. Well then secondly, 
The progress continues in the Christian life as it continued in the life of the people of Israel. There's more progress for them as they make use of the spoils of the Midianite war. They'd had their battles, they'd fought a good fight, they had taken prisoners and they had taken spoil. And Jehovah had given them the victory and they all felt it. They went out in his name and they triumphed in his name. And after the war, a division of the spoils, the booty was made. And the remainder of chapter 31 describes the distribution of these spoils. It was divided into two equal parts. One part given to those who went into the battle and the other belonged to those who remained in the camp. And so there was a sharing, a distribution. Verse 27. And then the prey contained people and animals. The soldiers were to give to the Lord one out of every of the 500 captives, cattle and asses and sheep, according to verse 28 here. And the people who by staying at home risk nothing were to give one in 50 of the allocation. And this division between the soldiers and the people given to the Lord and to the Levites were according to a table that we can see in the next few verses with the thousands of people that were taken, the thousands of sheep and cattle and asses and the human captives as well. And it's all laid out there in the passage. Out of these allocations, the soldiers and the people were to give to the Lord and to the Levites. There were to be sacrifices to be made. There were allocations to the commonwealth of Israel. So the sheep to the Lord by the soldiers, 675 were given, but to the Levites by the people, 6,750. You can see here that the soldiers were able to keep more than the general con congregation. But the division has a purpose. The cattle, the asses, and the human captives, 32 people were given, or Captives were given to the Lord by the soldiers, but 320 to the Levites by the people. And that is one of the difficulties of Scripture in that we do not have any information on these captives and what actually happened to them. We know what had happened, that the men had all been killed, that the women who had been involved in enticing Israel, that is, the mature women, were also executed, but the younger ones they retained, were retained. What happened to them, we can only assume from the common practices of those days that they became servants within the people of Israel. And hopefully they would have found faith in Jehovah as proselyte people. But we can notice that it is the supply of animals for the present physical needs of the Israelites these Israelites who are still travellers on their way to the homeland were certainly very timely. It was part of God's divine timetable to provide for them. They had come through the desert. Yes, they still had the manna that was produced day after day that fell around the camp, so they had that food. But here was now food in the form of animals, of, of meat and of milk. And the huge congregation of Israel had fresh meat to eat for some days. The Lord had his sacrifices. The priests and the Levites were provided for also with food. And for the rest of Israel, they had the meat products to supplement the manna. And that continued until they got onto the other side of Jordan, when the manna miraculously ceased. And then secondly, the portions which were given by the warriors to the priests and by the congregation to the Levites were called here, according to verse 29, a tribute unto the Lord, a heave offering of the Lord. And surely this was right and appropriate. The Lord God had given them the victory over the Midianites. And you know, they would have been guilty of ingratitude and injustice if they had not presented a thank offering to the Lord, thankful for the victory over the Midianites, thankful for all the spoil and for the booty, and it was vast. 
And we should be concerned by way of application that of all our gains, a portion should be devoted to the Lord God. Thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. So says Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18. Remember the Lord thy God. Remember who it is that has given thee anything. God has given us all things richly to enjoy and he can expect from us a contribution to him. So do we have our giving for the Lord's work properly allocated? No, it's not so much a question of duty or obligation. It is out of thanks to the Lord who has provided everything necessary for us, for life and for godliness. We are dependent on the Lord and we are to give him and his cause as much as we can afford. See, progress in the Christian life affects our wallets and our purses. Giving thanks to the Lord can be a delight, can be a pleasure when we share gladly what we have been given. After all, we'll not be taking anything with us when we leave this scene and our souls are separated from our bodies. We will be with Christ, which is far better, and we take nothing, we have, nothing with us. Will we be wise in our allocation of what God has provided for us after we have been promoted to glory? You know, often providing for the work of the gospel overrides what we provide for our descendants and for those whom we leave, whether it be money or whether it be possessions. We need to be very careful of that. God has given them all. We recognize it. And therefore they belong to him. And the Lord's work is important. And then thirdly, we must take note of verse 49. It's a wonderful verse, this, in this chapter. You look down the chapter. Verse 49, they said unto Moses, thy servants have taken the sum of the men of war, which are under our charge, and there lacketh not one man of us. You notice that? Not one Israelite, with all that hardship of war, was killed in the battle. Not one. They all came home, which was a wonderful proof of God's prayer and protection. 24,000 had fallen in the plague following the sin with the Midianites. But not even one in the war with the powerful people of Midian in the battle. Now for us, even though there are great dangers for us as Christian soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ, and yes, there are reasons to fear in the battle, yet there is an unseen hand upholding and protecting us as we go out in faith. How many of us will know of those fights that we've had, those battles that we've had, and that we have come through, and we thought, however did I manage that? And it is this unseen hand of God. Don't think we can testify to the enemies around us of being terrified of God, like the enemies of the Israelites were, but there is that protecting as we go out in faith. And when the battles of life are over, you know, there'll be a wonderful counting made. The battles of life, of course, when they're over, will be when we're in heaven. And their counting will be made. And who will be lost? Of all the elect of the Lord Jesus Christ, all those who have been chosen in him, been loved from the foundation of the world, been protected, been brought to faith in him, not one will be lost. Not one will be missing. There will lack not one man, not one woman of us that has been saved by grace. No one missing in heaven. Praise the Lord for that. Much to praise God for. Now this fact must have caused or produced a strong impression in the minds of the officers and the captains and the tribes. They were thankful to God as they should have been. And so they showed their thankfulness by an additional free will offering to the Lord God. 
This was not exacted upon them, but they gave freely themselves. Look at verse 50. We have therefore brought an oblation for the Lord, what every man hath gotten, of jewels of gold, chains, bracelets, rings, earrings, and tablets, to make an atonement for our souls before the Lord. We're talking now and seeing the riches that have been gathered from the Midianites, which were brought to Moses and Eliezer, who in turn laid them up in the tabernacle of the congregation, a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord. And so these officers, these captains, these soldiers who had stripped the slain of Midian, and in those days it was their practice to wear not only jewellery but amulets and lots of rich things on their bodies, and so they were taken off and called, carried off as spoils of war. But they were being brought by these officers to the Lord to be laid up. It's mentioned here in this verse that it was an atonement, but a gift was not an atonement in the strictest sense of the word, because we know that atonement is something that covers guilt, and there was no guilt involved here amongst the men of the army. It was a gratitude gift, and so purged of one potential threat to their spiritual life, and so, having been given physical sustenance for their present needs, all those animals, and reassured of the presence and help of Jehovah their God against alien nations, the Israelites were now on the brink. They were ready to cross the Jordan River into the Promised Land and to fight the battles of the conquest under Joshua and to go forward into the battle. Now, mention was made about progress in the life of Israel earlier. What progress was it that they had made? Well, God taught the Israelites that practically they themselves and all that they had belonged to him. And so now he is training them in a spirit of self-denial. This is the lesson that we can speak, uh, find speaking to us too in our Christian lives. And that's because, sadly, amongst us, love and self-denial is so much of a paucity in our lives, lacking as two graces which should be uppermost. We know that love suffers long and is kind. It covers a multitude of sins. We can look in 1 Corinthians 13 and see all those things that love is about. It's not puffed up does not behave itself unseemly, and so on. And self-denial, well, that crucifies our old nature and stimulates us to place God's glory, and that alone, in front of our own comfort and our ease and our pleasure. Sadly, there are many believers who are sound in doctrine, but they seem to find great pleasure in claiming that they are free from this error and that error. Yet we find that there can be much self-indulgence in their lives, even though they seem to be those super sort of Christians. They hope to earn heaven by denying themselves and being amazing in their self-denial and how much that they can achieve. And they'll go through with that thought that it's earning them heaven. Well, what is most powerful? What is most powerful is the free and full salvation that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ by grace, God's divine gift to us that we cannot earn anything. It's the wonderful love of the Lord Jesus Christ that's imparted to us by faith. That makes the difference. And so what is the answer? Oh, we look at our Saviour. We look at him, the great Saviour of love, the one who loved our souls so much. His whole life was one of self-surrender and self-sacrifice. And we should aim to be like him in this. Now Mr. Spurgeon comments on this principle and I quote him. The weakness of the instrument is a small matter when the hand of God is infinitely strong. 
You and I have said we are men full of infirmities. What can we do? We have but few talents. We have no social position. We don't have the opportunities of doing good that some have. And therefore we are discouraged. But the Lord knows our hearts. If you were lower in the scale of society, if you only had half a talent, if you were less able to speak than you are, or if you were a man or a woman slow of speech like Moses, yet if God be behind you, do you not know that every weakness of yours is according to his own intention and purpose and is as much designed as the strength of the strongest to illustrate the majesty of his might? Spurgeon goes on to say, if only you knew, and if only you would believe, then your weakness would be your glory. You would rejoice even to be nothing, that in this, the great all in all, the mighty God, might the more wonderfully display himself. Well, let us play, pray to be like Jesus. Let's acknowledge that we owe everything to the Lord God. Self-denial. Oh, that, my friend, is a daily exercise. Once again, consider how little the Israelites had to give in consecration to the Lord out of all this vast amount that they had got from this battle with the Midianites. And yet they gave cheerfully. One five hundredth, one fiftieth part of the spoils. That's all it was that they had to give. For us, those who have been given much, we can give much. We think of Zacchaeus in the New Testament who the Lord Jesus ministered to and his hand come down from the sycamore tree. What did he do when he was converted? He gave half of his goods to the poor. And the Lord by his Spirit speaks to us through our consciences and settles our giving to God as we fall on our knees and ask him what to do. Such will be our offerings of time and energy and substance. They are pleasing to the Lord. And so we find now, as we close, Israel progressing towards the next phase of the conflict. All that these things that they've learnt as they've gone along, they're now trusting in the Lord. It's a different style of battle. It is a holy war. It is for Jehovah. It is for God himself. Yet they are learning day by day on the way. So let us then be determined to grow and progress in the faith, looking to the Lord Jesus Christ as we onward go. Amen. Let's pray together.